is a bit of trivia for you. Our kidneys filter the blood in our body many times in a day. And upon doing so, the kidneys produce around 180 liters of filtrate, which means that around 180 liters of urine is produced by the kidneys in a day. Do we really excrete this much amount of urine? If we did, we'd forever be stuck inside the bathroom, right? That does not happen. We excrete only around 800 to 1200 ml of urine. So, how does this number, that is 180 liters, come down all the way to around 1.2 liters? Now, this is all thanks to the nephrons in your kidneys. Now, this is a very important process because our body does not like to waste its substances. Whatever water, electrolytes like sodium, potassium, whatever ions, whatever glucose, our body tries to conserve it because it needs those valuable resources. So, the kidneys make sure that a lot of these resources are reabsorbed back into the circulation from the filtrate, producing only around 800 to 1200 ml of urine. Now, what does this have to do with the topic of our video, which is the countercurrent multiplication? So, we already took a look at the different parts of the nephron in previous videos. I'm not going to go into detail about the structures involved, but in this video, we're going to focus on the renal tubule part of the nephron which includes the proximal convoluted tubule, the loop of Henle, the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting duct. Now in the previous video I also talked about how the nephron extends from the cortex into the medulla. Some nephrons extend deep into the medulla whereas some nephrons are just at the tip of the medulla. But whatever it is, if you take a look at the nephron structure, the loop of Henle is always in the medulla. Now, this is there for a very specific reason. Before we get to that reason, let's take a look at the osmolarity of the interstitial fluid. What is the interstitial fluid or the interstitial space? It is this space surrounding this nephron, whatever is there, this is the interstitial space. So, the osmolarity of the interstitial space increases as we go down from the cortex into the medulla. It starts out at around 300 m osm per liter at the cortex, maybe at the junction between the cortex and the medulla. But as we go down the medulla, the osmolarity of the interstitial fluid increases. This means that the medulla is highly concentrated with solutes and because those solutes are most often electrolytes, we can also say that the medulla is very salty in nature. So this is very important. Why? To answer that question, let's follow the journey of the filtrate once it leaves the Bowman's capsule and reaches the proximal convoluted tubule. At the proximal convoluted tubule, a lot of solutes like glucose, amino acids, all essential nutrients and a lot of other substances are reabsorbed into the interstitial space from the proximal convoluted tubule. So what enters the descending limb of the loop of Henle is actually a dilute urine. When you think about it, if you are not removing water, if you are removing only the solutes from a solution, then the solution becomes more dilute. Dilute, right? So, what reaches the descending limb of the loop of Henle is a dilute urine. Now, at the descending limb, you have these channels known as aquaporins. Now, these aquaporins and the general descending limb of the loop of Henle is only permeable to water and not permeable to sodium or potassium or any other electrolytes. So, because there is a dilute urine reaching the descending limb and due to the aquaporins, a lot of water gets reabsorbed into the interstitial space. So, now the dilute urine, because we are removing only water and no electrolytes, becomes even more concentrated. As we are removing the water, the concentration of the solutes inside the filtrate is going to increase, which makes the urine more concentrated. So, next the filtrate moves up to the ascending limb of the loop of Henle. Now, the ascending limb is reverse in terms of permeability. It is permeable to sodium but not to water. We just learned that the medulla is highly concentrated, it is highly salty because of the osmolarity. But if you compare the concentration of these solutes in the ascending limb filtrate and the interstitial space, the interstitial space has more of these electrolytes. So, which means that there is a higher concentration of these ions here compared to the inside. 
In spite of this, sodium is actively reabsorbed at the ascending loop of Henle, which means that with the expense of energy, sodium is moved against its concentration gradient from the ascending limb into the interstitial space. Now, we are not moving water. From the solution, we are not removing water, but we are removing only the solute, only the sodium. This means that we are actually making the urine dilute here. So, this seems sort of counterintuitive, right? Why do we need to make it concentrated and make it more dilute again? There is a reason for this happening. Water always moves down its concentration gradient by the process of osmosis. So, for water to be reabsorbed from the descending limb of loop of Henle back into the interstitial fluid, it means that the water concentration must be high inside the filtrate but low in the interstitial space. In contrast, it also means that the concentration of solutes must be high here compared to inside the filtrate. To make the medulla more concentrated, to increase the concentration of the solutes, the electrolytes in the medulla, so more and more water can be driven out through the aquaporins, sodium is actively reabsorbed in the ascending limb of the loop of Henle. So the entire reason why this happens, why the sodium is actively reabsorbed in the ascending limb is to make the medulla more concentrated, more concentrated so that more water will move out from the descending limb. This step here is what reduces greatly this 180 liter of filtrate into around 1.2 liters of filtrate. So this is what forms the counter current part of counter current multiplication because the filtrate is moving in two different directions. One is down the descending limb and then up the ascending limb. So that forms the counter current part of the counter current multiplication. What about the multiplication part? The multiplication part comes from the difference in the osmolarity of the fluid in the descending limb and the ascending limb. Initially, the difference in their osmolarity is around 20 milliosmols per liter. But as more and more fluid keeps getting into the descending limb and as more and more water is exiting out and as the fluid is pushed into the ascending limb where more and more sodium is being pushed out, the difference in the concentration gradient, the difference in their osmolarities keeps on increasing. So, this is the descending limb and this is the ascending limb. Initially, the difference is around 20 but as more and more fluid gets pushed down, the difference increases, which means there is more of a concentration gradient. So say it increases to 40 and then to 80 and then to 100 maybe. So literally we can say that the concentration is multiplying in the ascending and the descending limbs of the loop of Henle, which is why this entire mechanism by which the reabsorption of water is facilitated at the loop of Henle is known as counter current multiplication. Now you may be thinking that it is sort of counterintuitive, right? We are making the urine more concentrated in the descending limb, but we are making it more dilute at the ascending limb. Why is it so? This is okay because we still have the collecting duct that further helps in concentrating the urine. So the collecting duct is also permeable to water not just water, also to urea. So remember the urine is now become dilute as it reaches the distal convoluted tubule from the loop of Henle. The distal convoluted tubule does not have a major role in terms of reabsorption. Instead, it is involved in secretion where a lot of substances are secreted from the interstitial fluid into the filtrate. So by the time the urine reaches the collecting duct, it becomes even more concentrated because the distal convoluted tubule has added a lot of substances to the filtrate. So as the filtrate reaches the collecting duct, more water is reabsorbed into the interstitial space. Now the filtrate in the collecting duct also has urea. As more and more water keeps moving out of the collecting duct, the urea concentration inside the collecting duct increases. So now there is a concentration gradient for urea as well. 
So active collecting duct urea, a little bit of urea also moves out into the interstitial space. So here you may be wondering, urea is our nitrogenous waste, right? This is what we produce as a result of metabolism. What is the purpose of reabsorbing some of it into the interstitial space when the entire purpose of it is to be excreted out? That's because urea also contributes to the concentration gradient of the medulla. It also drives the reabsorption of water from the descending limb of the loop of Henle by making the medulla more concentrated. That's why our body is capable of tolerating a small amount of urea. So this is the entire process of countercurrent multiplication where water is reabsorbed in the descending limb of the loop of Henle and sodium is actively reabsorbed in the ascending limb of the loop of Henle. So initially the urine becomes more concentrated and then it becomes more dilute. But again, the final concentration of urine is adjusted by the collecting duct by allowing water and urea to be reabsorbed into the interstitial space. In the next video, we'll talk about what happens to this water and sodium and other substances that have been reabsorbed into the interstitial space. We'll talk about that process which is known as countercurrent exchange.